I am Murray Rankin, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. We're honoured to be here together in the traditional territory uh, of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, today the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I'd like to start this in a good way by inviting uh, Elder Butch Dick, a member of the Songhees Nation and of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, to start us off in a good way. Hi, Squatchel CMCAO. And thank you, Minister Rank, for the invitation again. Premier, it's always good to see you. You're looking well. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Rank for inviting me here this morning. And it's always nice to be in this house, especially with a lot of relatives here. It feels good. Thank you. It's a very special day with a very special declaration. And the first thing I seen when I sat down was the four feathers on the podium. In a lot of ways, that means a lot of things to us as First Nation people. Identity is the first thing. We have to teach our young about that identity and how important it is. And they have to be proud of that identity and their personal sovereignty as young people and also their potential that they have. The potential in our community is huge and they're going to benefit from this declaration. The second is confidence. We have to give our young people confidence by standing with them and cover them with a blanket that will protect them, show them that we love them. It's their future. Self-esteem has to be maintained. And that's up to, that's up to us as grandparents, great-grandparents, parents, aunties and uncles. They have to know that this is going to be their world. And the last one is respect. We're always taught to speak gratitude and to be thankful for everything that we have and that our families have and our communities have. It's vital. That personal sovereignty is what our great grandparents and our ancestors gave to us and saved for us. We realize that's through difficult times. And it's hard to put the past behind us. It's always there. It always shadows us. But we have to think of the young people today and what they're going to inherit. It has First Nation people, you know, our, our teachings and our language are attached to the earth. That means that we have to focus too on climate change and what kind of world our young people are going to have. And that's not only our young people, but all people across the, across the earth. So we wish today that things were better in our world But with inclusion, they will get better. And hopefully that would be with a lot of understanding. So I, I will do a traditional welcome and I will stop. And thank you for this opportunity this morning. I raise my hands to each and every one. I express you. Thank you very, very much, Elder Dick, and thank you for your wisdom. It's great to see you again. Thank you for 
allowing us to do this important work in your territory. I should also acknowledge so many other leaders who are here. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the elders, uh, First Nation leaders and chiefs from across the province who are here, welcome. And of course, Premier John Horgan. Um, here with us are representatives from a number of organizations. The so First Nation Leadership Council includes the BC Assembly of First Nations, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, First Nations Summit, as well as the Alliance of Modern Treaty Nations and the First Nation Justice Council. It's really an honor to be here today in the, in the company of so many uh, Indigenous leaders, you know, people who've dedicated their lives to the full pursuit of upholding the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples in our province. It's been an honor for me and a journey for me as Minister to, to, to learn from them in so many ways and having the benefit of their ongoing counsel as well. Uh, and I'm really so glad and, and grateful that you've come here to bear witness to what I think is really truly an historic day. I suspect we'll hear that word a lot. So in November of 2019, a unanimous legislative assembly of British Columbia passed unanimously the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And it was the first jurisdiction in this, this continent to do so. I don't want to forget Bolivia, but we're making history again today because here today we're presenting in the legislature this document. This is the action plan, the first action plan in the world to be created, to be co-developed, and to be tabled before the people of British Columbia. It was built in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. It articulates 89 specific, tangible, measurable things that each and every ministry of our government is committed to do. Because the action plan is a legal requirement under the Declaration Act, and it's a solemn commitment, but it's much, much more than that. It articulates a vision that has been co-created of a province where the rights of Indigenous peoples are fully realized, respected, upheld, and implemented. Because we believe that in doing so, in realizing the full potential of Indigenous rights, we realize the full potential of our province. Since passing the Declaration Act in 2019, the province, First Nations, Indigenous peoples, organizations have been engaged in this cooperative enterprise. And we faced, and no one needs to be reminded in this room, immense challenges during this time. I'm speaking of the twin pandemics. I'm speaking of atmospheric rivers and wildfires, and of course, the devastating impact of the findings in Kamloops and elsewhere. But through all of that, we continued to work together in good faith. And what has resulted is specific actions for every ministry to advance the implementation of the United Nations Declaration in important areas like education, children and families, forestry, water resources, and so much more. Our government is working hard to make meaningful progress on the full implementation of the rights of Indigenous peoples in our province, and to do so in cooperation and consultation with them. I want to also acknowledge the support and interest from our other partners who have been standing with us side by side as we do this work. I'm talking of local governments. I'm talking of business and industry, of nonprofits, of the scholars in this field. Thank you for sharing your commitment and your ideas with us to make sure that this is not just words, it cannot be words, because we will be held accountable every year in a real way to see if we've done what we promised to do together. So this will not be a report like others that will gather dust. It cannot, it's not allowed to be. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. We've got a lot of challenges, no question about it. It's going to be challenging, but I think together we can change the trajectory of our shared history and create a future where the full potential of Indigenous peoples is realized. That's the province we want. That's the province we need, the province we deserve, and the province we will finally build together. I would now like to welcome, virtually, Hagus John Hackett, 
to speak on behalf of the Alliance of Modern Treaty Nations, who's appearing virtually today with us via Zoom, to give us some comments on the action plan. Hagus Hackett. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Hackett, Hague's uh, Klama Nation. I thank you, Premier Ho Horgan, Minister Rankin, for inviting me to be here today. I would like to thank and recognize the honored elders, Indigenous leaders, and respected uh, representatives for allowing me to be a part of this remarkable event with you. I'm honored to speak today on behalf of the Alliance of the BC Modern Treaty Nations, whose membership include the eight modern treaty nations in BC. Uh, the action plan to implement the UNDRIP represents over two years of work by the province, Indigenous peoples, and organizations across BC. It has been two years of intense engagement, two years of debate and discussion, two years of meaningful collaboration driven by the wisdom of the ancestors and filled with hope for a bright future. The modern treaty nations have been an important part of the action plan and action plan development process. This unprecedented project has been challenging work. It has been thoughtful work. It has been rewarding work. The Alliance is pleased this work has come to fruition. The nations are pleased because now it's time for action. The action plan is a significant step in achieving lasting re reconciliation between the province of British Columbia and Indigenous peoples. The commitments to transform, transformative change that are outlined in the action plan will help all of us move forward on our journey to reconciliation in a productive way, in a sincere way, and a meaningful way. And there's a lot at stake in the action plan for the modern treaty nations in BC. Modern treaty, modern treaty nations have a unique, distinct relationship with the province, which is reflective in the action plan. For the modern treaty nations, when the province committed to implementing the UNDRIP, it is meant that the province is honoring our treaties and recommitting to our treaty relationship. The action plan goes one step further. The action plan will help ensure the treaties that we develop within the province will be implemented. It will help ensure that the rights we have established with the province will be upheld and will help ensure that the nations, our communities and our citizens will benefit from the full effective implementation of our treaties. As a part of the, as a part of the under, work under the action plan, the province and the modern treaty nations have entered into a shared priorities framework. The framework renews, the, renews their shared commitments to timely, effectively, and fully resource implementation of our treaties. The launch of the action plan today is an important step towards reconciliation and towards fulfilling our shared commitments. On behalf of the Alliance of the BC Modern Treaty Nation, I thank you, Chiche Hatich Imut. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, much Hagas. Thank you very much for, for, your, for your remarks. Uh, I wish you were here with us because it's not very often we manage to get together in person. And so uh, I'm sorry we, you, weren't, you were here virtually, but it's great to have you all the same. I'd now like to invite Rosalie Yazzie, who's the Vice Chair of the First Nations Justice Council, for her comments on the action plan. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional territories of uh, the Songhees and Lekwungen-speaking people, and I'm here on, today on behalf of the BC First Nations Justice Council. I'm happy to be here uh, today to acknowledge the next milestone in the implementation of the UNDRIP in British Columbia. The Justice Council recognizes the continued leadership of the First Nations Leadership Council, the Premier, Minister Rankin, and others in moving this work forward. The work of the Justice Council is, of course, about one aspect of the real on-the-ground reality faced by Indigenous peoples as we continue to grapple with the legacy of colonialism. That reality is of racism and overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, continued abuse and violence at the hands of the police in a court system that is alienating foreign and frankly, inequitable and unjust for our people. 
I say all of this because the Justice Council is one of the areas of work that speaks to the urgency of meeting the objectives of the UN Declaration. We cannot ask people who are suffering the way so many Indigenous peoples are con or to continue waiting. We cannot offer them excuses and we cannot ask them for patience. We either are making tangible changes that address this issue in real ways or we are failing. First Nations and BC have adopted the justice strategy and that is a roadmap. Implementation has been a struggle, supporting and funding have been a struggle, and reconciliation is a process that takes us all out of our comfort zone. And if you don't, unfeel, if you don't feel uncomfortable, you're not doing it right. Today's action plan represents an important advancement towards reconciliation between BC First Nations and the government of British Columbia. <clears throat> the action plan clearly articulates the province's commitment to prioritize the implementation of the BC First Nations Justice Strategy as one of its key priorities. For far too long, First Nations and other Indigenous people have been overrepresented in the criminal justice system, and now is the time to work towards greater self-determination in all matters, including justice. The action plan has been crafted to not only outline the province's commitments, but also to call for annual reporting to the legislature. And we're look, we look forward to receiving the province's first progress report that will outline its progress with respect to the implementation of the BC First Nations Justice Strategy. Our hope is that the action plan helps accelerate all of this work, including the realization that the justice strategy must be fully implemented now. So we are here today with you acknowledging the leadership that you have shown with that hope and asking that collectively we advance this work in the way that we all must and sorely need. Lim -lim Thanks very much, Ms. Yazzie. I'd now like to invite uh, Chief Jerry Jack of the Moachat Machalak, the Chalnath people from Gold River to, to speak on behalf of the BC Assembly of First Nations. Chief. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Clark Wagela. I come from the House of Zistot and Mocha Territory. Um, just like to thank our elder for opening us up in a good way this today, and it's a really honor to be on your territory to allow me to stand here and to speak to people today. You know, we live in a society today where it isn't done very often, and I really appreciate you opening up the way you did. Thank you so much. Um, thank all the people from Esquimalt Song East and Coast Salish for allowing us to be here. And before I get started, thank, just thank uh, Premier Horgan. First time I've really met you, and when you were going through your health issues, I was concerned. You know, uh, to me, you're doing amazing work in this province, and I hold my hands up to you for everything that you guys do, Minister Rick. And um, um, I am. Um, a board of director for the BC Assembly of First Nations, and I am here today uh, representing uh, Regional Chief Terry TG. He couldn't make it, and graciously asked me to stand in the spot. And it's honored to be here. You know, I'm nervous as heck. I've had a knot in my stomach since I've been asked. <laughs> you know, but that's part of life. You know, the BC Assembly of First Nations commends the significant efforts that have been brought to us to launch the DRIPA action plan today. The plan sets out expectation for the renewed relationship between First Nations people and the government of British Columbia and charts a path of reconciliation for all the people in the province. While the majority of our work still before us, we can be encouraged that the progress we have made and the de dedication has been shown provides a strong foundation. And to me, that's really important because what we've been going through is multi-generational. You know, I went with my dad in the 70s to blockades, fighting for our land and our rights. You know, and you know, this picture says it all. We're, I don't want my grandkids to grow up in the struggles I have to um, have our rights recognized, our, our lands back, you know. Um, since the passage of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act in 2019, our communities have faced a lot of challenges, the uh, COVID impact, the wildfires and the floods. And uh, I just want to acknowledge all the leadership in all the communities across this province for standing up and 
looking after the people the way they do. You know, it's, it's hard work. It's uh, a lot. It's a lot of responsibility, but um, we're here to do it. And you know, when I, when I started, you know, I said I was a hereditary chief. I'm not a fan of Captain Cook, but when he landed in Friendly Cove in 1778, he was met by two head chiefs, McCona and Calicum, and I'm a direct descendant of Chief Calicum. You know, that's, that's where I get my chieftainship from, and it's been passed down ever since. I just needed to share that because, to me, it's important. Um, the, these experiences have made it even more clear how critical it is that the rights, well-being, and self-determination First Nations people are respected, upheld, <clears throat> in the context of right relationship. If we are to be a part of the transformational change and face challenges of our generation with integrity, wisdom, and love, we must all work together. You know, and uh, love is a strong word. <laughs> you know, we, that's how we have to treat each other, even if you have disagreements. Um, today marks a step in the right direction, and the BCAFN looks forward to working with all First Nations in British Columbia our First Nations Leadership Council partners and government of British Columbia on the next phase of working together. And uh, just in closing, just thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Premier Oregon, once again for everything that you do for our people. I never thought in my life I'd be standing in a place saying something like that, but you know, I, I just had to. Clacko, clacko. Thank you very much, Klako. I, uh, I really appreciate your referencing that simple word, love, and the word that then the Chalnith taught me, which is Isak, the word of respect, which is, I think, also very relevant. And thank you very much for what you said, Chief. I think that's it. I'd now like to invite uh, Cheryl Casimir to comment on behalf of the First Nations Summit. Thank you, Minister uh, Rankin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. I first of all want to start off by acknowledging and thanking Elder Dick for your beautiful words and your warm welcome. Um, not wanting to also acknowledge the traditional territory of the Esquimalt and Songhees peoples. Thank you for opening up your doors and allowing us to do this important work here today. Thank you, Premier Horgan and Minister Rankin for the invitation that uh, you provided to us. And I'm really happy uh, to be here today. And I'm most especially happy about being able to see people in person and to be able to see so, so many friends. It was November 2019, the last time that I, I, I think that it was actually um, here. And that was when we introduced uh, Bill 41 um, into the legislature. And so, it was a milestone then, um, and today it is another milestone because in passing um, Bill 41, the province took a historic step towards writing its uh, relationship with First Nations here in British Columbia. Uh, this was a significant and necessary step in our collective work of reconciliation. And so today we're here to also acknowledge another significant step. And so today is really all about this. It's all about the action plans that have been identified and co-developed between the provincial government and the leadership council, as well as numerous First Nation title and rights holders across this province who participated in the development of those plans. So to me, the action plan really is about the meat on the bones, right? We, we, had, we had the framework through Bill 41 and we had some challenges, you know, trying to get the government to do certain things um, just with the legislation itself. And now we have the action plan that lays out some concrete actions in terms of how we're going to move this relationship forward. And what I really like about the action plan is that every action has a ministry that is attached to it. So we know who's gonna be responsible for implementing that action plan in partnership though with titles and rights holders here in, in this province. 
even though it does have uh, ministries attached to the actions, I think that it's going to be really important to ensure that it is a whole of government approach in terms of implementing these actions. Um, I also um, wanted to also state that in order to, to see success in the implementation of these actions, we also need to do some, uh, some heavy lifting and some big work that needs to take place within this system of government, within this bureaucracy. And I think that in partnership, we need to work towards transforming and decolonizing the legislative process and overcome some barriers that currently exist that doesn't really fully allow full participation from title and rights holders in the development of legislation. I think that it's safe to say that this big house was never really open to us as Indigenous peoples or people of colour. And that is slowly starting to change. But the legislative process that currently exists is still archaic and colonial, and we need to work towards changing that as well if we want to realise true success in the action plan. And I know that the Premier Horgan and his government are open to doing that because we've already done, we've already taken certain steps towards achieving that, but we need to take some bigger steps. So, I know that we're supposed to be moving into the next room. I don't want to take up too much more time as I will be speaking further to the action plan in the room as well. But I just again wanted to thank the, um, the NDP government for taking that leap of faith with Indigenous peoples in this province um, towards, first of all, developing the legislation and now the action plan that we have. And I think it's a tool that each and every one of us here as well, not just Indigenous peoples, but British Columbians, I'm hoping are going to be able to embrace this action plan and see themselves in it, because I think that we need to work on this together. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Daha. Thanks very much, Cheryl, and thanks for reminding us of our collective need to ensure we engage all of British Columbia in our exercise over five years with this action plan. I really appreciate your wise words. I'd now like to invite uh, Chief Don Tom. Don, Chief Tom is the Vice President of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and he will also address the action plan. Thanks, Chief. CM uh, Nassau Quinn. CMDCA. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you to uh, Minister Rankin and uh, thank you to uh, Premier for uh, the excellent work uh, you are doing today. I'm a bit remiss. My apologies. I'd like to thank the elder, uh, my relative Butch, for uh, starting us off in a good way and for welcoming us into uh, your respective territories. Hi, uh, my dear friends, uh, what an exciting day it is today to, uh, to begin to take these big steps to implement the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, after this, it will now uh, compel the government to begin to uh, co-develop and to begin to work with First Nations in a way that hasn't been done before. And if we look at uh, a history that's a little bit older than me, uh, in 1966, uh, the, the, um, uh, the UBCIC was born out of uh, when the federal government wanted to create the so-called white paper. And uh, looking at our history of how legislation, of how uh, I think Indigenous people, First Nations, Indians were perceived in this country has drastically changed. And we're no longer looking at uh, First Nations, looking at Indigenous peoples as, uh, as uh, those who are, um, have a right to self-determination, those who have uh, a way forward and recognizing that at one time it wasn't, we weren't allowed to speak our language. Children were taken away from our communities. I want to, it's important to look at our history to understand the steps that are being taken today by a government. Uh, this is uh, big steps today that uh, the BC government is taking to, uh, uh, to share their action plan with British Columbians and to share it with First Nations. And a lot of work has gone into uh, the development of this. Uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs has been a part of uh, co-developing this. 
uh, in supporting this to, to get us thus far. And we're looking forward to the, the hard work that comes next, the hard work that, uh, that we know that politicians, we know that uh, bureaucrats, public servants, must all be aware of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and must be fully aware of it. And I think uh, I, I'm excited to begin to negotiate with you guys now too. So um, it just changes, uh, it, it changes the, the feeling of the room when we sit down with the province. So um, I know that uh, many First Nations are excited to see the details of this action plan. Many First Nations are excited to sit down with the province and to uh, share their local history and to share their knowledge and to begin to uh, set themselves uh, a place in history just as we are here today to witness the, the action plan of uh, British Columbia. So uh, it is my privilege to, to uh, share a few comments here today on behalf of the, the UBCIC and also send regrets for uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, who isn't uh, available to, to be here with us, but he sent his uh, best, second best person, and that's me. So. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop there, Minister. Uh, I just want you to know, uh, Chief, that 1966 is not that long ago for some of us. You know? <laughs> And last but certainly not least, I have the honour and privilege to invite Premier Horgan to offer his comments on this. I think a lot of words have been said about leadership and a lot of work, words have been talk, uh, spoken about the declaration, but the spark plug, the driving agent, the person who put in every minister's mandate letter the need to address reconciliation in a meaningful way, the person who's supported this and driven this from ever since I got this honour of serving in this role is going to speak to us now. Premier Horgan. Thanks, uh, Minister Rankin and uh, guests. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Elder Dick, always delighted to see you, and thank you so much for uh, allowing us to come into your territory today, the uh, unceded territory of the uh, Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekongan-speaking people of this territory. Uh, it is an honor to live here, uh, to have spent my life here playing lacrosse with uh, Don's dad in about 1966, I think it was. <laughs> but. Uh, so I'm with Murray on the time passage question, but uh, it is a, a real privilege to be here with, uh, with all of you, and I want to acknowledge uh, Chief Jack starting by reminding us that there is a direct line in this room and in this province back to the expansion of Europe, back to colonialism. This is not something that's theoretical for Indigenous people. It's real every single day, and uh, Chief Jack, you brought that home very clearly today, so I, I thank you for that. I want to acknowledge also that uh, Terry TG couldn't be here with us today uh, and that um, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and most importantly Joan, who would I, be, I assume would be the number one uh, best uh, person, uh, Joan couldn't be with us today and uh, it's not just because uh, uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip has dedicated his entire life to moving these issues forward and, and it's been a life filled with struggle, a life filled with joy and a life filled with the culmination of that work in November of 2019, but today is a particularly important day, and if for no other reason than to hear Rosalie say, as Grand Chief would have loved, if this isn't making you uncomfortable, you're not doing it right, that sounds like something that Grand Chief would have said uh, without any, uh, any hesitation whatsoever. So I thank you, Rosalie, for bringing, uh, bringing Grand Chief Stuart Phillip into the room in your words today. It is uh, also a time I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that got us here. Uh, Scott Fraser, uh, who uh, stepped away from politics uh, to pursue a, a real life, uh, and uh, giving space uh, in doing so to, to uh, having Murray come and join us. And I'm grateful for Murray's arrival, his vast experience, uh, his understanding of these issues goes back decades, even to 1966. And uh, that's a great asset to the government of British Columbia, to the people of British Columbia, and indeed all of us as we work through these challenges. Um, I also want to acknowledge three people that had a profound impact on me over my, uh, the evolution of my thinking on these issues. Firstly, Jim Manley, who was a member of Parliament and the uh, NDP critic for Indigenous relations. It was called something different at the time, but he was the first person I worked for coming out of university and he instilled in me the importance of addressing these issues of, of justice on the land, of reconciliation 
long before these terms were, were on the tips of everyone's tongue. And also two individuals, Ian Waddell, who's no longer with us, and Tom Berger, another uh, great statesman from British Columbia who dedicated their lives uh, to reconciliation and the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, watching and observing them as a young man becoming an older man and sharing stories with Murray, who is even older, who had direct experience with both of them, has allowed me to better understand the struggles that have been on all sides of this question. I don't want for a minute to leave anyone with the impression that the work that has been done by legislators is anything remotely compared to a life, a lifetime, generations of hostility with the government of British Columbia and the government of Canada. Please don't misunderstand me. But there have been people for generations who have worked to get to where we are today, and we need to acknowledge that, and I know all of us will lift our hands to the people who came before us, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who are committed to the tasks that we have before us. We cannot step away from our past, the joys and the sorrows, but we must, we must learn from it. And although it has been uh, three very challenging, two and a half very challenging years, whether it be wildfires, floods, uh, atmospheric rivers, heat domes, pandemics, what all of those challenges have meant to all of us as individuals and as a collective in British Columbia is, if we're going to get through these challenges, best we do it together. Best we do it with a foundation of understanding that the first peoples, those represented here today, those that came before you, are vital parts of what we are as citizens in British Columbia. And three Indigenous First Nations members of this legislature can attest to that. And the most diverse legislature we have ever seen since 2020 attests to the changes and the transformations that are happening in our community every day as we acknowledge the rights of people of colour, as we acknowledge that all of us together are much stronger than individuals, whether it be nations uh, in parts of British Columbia or a collective represented by the First Nations Leadership Council. And apologies for uh, having to drink. I can't swallow anymore. I got to lose some weight, but I can't swallow anymore. That's the downside of uh, radiation. Uh, I want to also say that uh, the wildfires gave us an indication and a hint about how we could work together. The Abbott Chapman report brought together traditional understandings of how we manage fires. It brought together someone of George Abbott's stature who had been a member of this place and understood the challenges as being a former minister, how do we work together to bring traditional learnings and the practices of Indigenous peoples to the modern firefighting techniques that have been developed over time? And I'm reminded of being in, uh, in Okanagan territory this past summer and seeing the devastation on the coastline of houses gone, forests uh, disappeared, and one block of land where an 80-year-old elder a woman who had every year gone and done her fires on her territory to protect it, the only lands that were untouched by the fires were those that were tended by traditional means. Again, if we cannot collectively learn from what we have to give to each other, we will not be the prosperous, dynamic province that we all want to see. We have a long way to go. The action plan demonstrates that we were here for a purpose when we unanimously, all members of this House, joined by leaders of the First Nations Leadership Council, spoke eloquently about the moment and about the need to work together in the future. Now here we are, putting down the roadmap, preparing to take that journey together. As my friend Melanie Mark often says, we're all paddling together. Sometimes we're not all in the same canoe, but we're all paddling together. What we want to see as a government, what we want to see as a society, what British Columbians want, is to ensure that the benefits of our collective understandings of this great land and this great space that we get to call home. Working together, we can do almost anything. If we continue to fight with each other, if we continue to disagree on the moment, we will fail. We will have disagreements going forward. Make no mistake of that. We may have disagreements later on this afternoon, but that doesn't take away from our mutual commitment to each other to make sure that we do everything we can, our level best, to make British Columbia a better place for the children, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who should be, by right, inheriting a province and a world that is better than the one that we inherited. We must learn from our past, the sorrow and the joy. But we will not do it if we turn our backs on the revelations from the Kemlops. We will not do that if we forget about what happened in Williams Lake, what happened on Cooper Island, what happened in Alert Bay. 
We will not go forward until we all collectively acknowledge and reconcile that truth and then move forward together. I am so proud of the work that we have done together and inspired by the challenges ahead of us. Heishke OCM to all of you. Let's go make the world a better place. I think it's over to you, Lizzie, for the media availability. Thank you. As a reminder to reporters on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will get one question and one follow-up. We have media in the room. If you have a question, please raise your hand and identify yourself. First question today is Dirk Meisner, Canadian Press. Hi. Um, mm. I think the last time I checked, there's like more than 200 First Nations in British Columbia. and. Okay, and I, and I don't know really who to ask it from, but I'm wondering if someone from the Indigenous representatives that was here or is here could explain how you're all going to be able to have the same or same point of view when you go in to try to put together all these, this action plan. Call on uh, Cheryl as the senior member of the Leadership Council present today or, or Don uh, or Lydia or... Rosalie, <laughs> either one, whoever wants to, yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, what it really comes down to is what the United Nations Declaration speaks to itself, and it talks about self-determination. And so that is how we're going to be able to work together. I mean, it took um, all of us in this province to work in cooperation and in um, consultation with the province to develop the action plan itself. So it already is a reflection of what some of our priorities. And so, it, as the Premier had stated, it is a roadmap for the work that lies ahead. So we are hoping everybody is going to be able to participate, as I said in my comments earlier, to have ownership of this action plan. Sorry, I forgot to take this all the way off. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how, how we see it moving forward. you have a follow-up? might be a bit easier question. Um, in one of the actions I see that um, there's a plan to possibly review how we name municipalities and regional districts. How, so are, are we going to rename a whole bunch of towns and, and regional districts in, in the province? Well, we're, we're doing that now, Dirk, uh, based on community input, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I, I'm, I don't know if Murray can uh, inventory the number of uh, regional districts or areas that have uh, applied for a name change. This is done in consultation with Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. There's not a there's not an expectation that there will be a raft of name changes, but if that's the will of the community, I think that's an appropriate thing to do. And I, quite frankly, I'm finding as we engage, Cabinet has to approve these name changes. It's part of the, the archaic system that we talked about. Uh, uh, we ensure that there's full buy-in from uh, communities. Uh, this is not done arbitrarily. It's done at the uh, request of communities, and it's usually done with uh, input from as many people as possible. Shannon Waters, BC Today. Hi, um, I am wondering if you can reconcile a situation within the province currently. So we're here talking about reconciliation, recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples, but your government is currently in court fighting a specific First Nations claim to what it says is, is, is its traditional territory. You've prioritized spending money on it, the case is currently active. So. Given what we're talking about here today, how do you explain acting on this action plan while also continuing with court actions like this one? Well, it speaks to the diverse nature of British Columbia, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and we're not always going to agree. Uh, courts are obviously the last recourse when there's disagreement. Uh, I can name uh, countless experiences in my five years, or just shy of five years in this job, where we have avoided uh, litigation or court uh, discussions because we found a way to reconcile and negotiate. Uh, and a good example would be the Blueberry decision. Uh, uh, the province would have in traditional times appealed that as a matter of course. Uh, we chose to not do that and instead sit down and, and negotiate. Uh, the case uh, in the Channel of Territory that you're referring to is one that unfortunately couldn't get resolved without uh, uh, it ending up in a courtroom, but the, the direction to litigate that litigators is not provided by cabinet, it's provided by the Attorney General, and if you have questions about their strategies, you should take it up with him. Follow-up, Shannon? Yes, yeah, so we've got 89 um, 
priorities or actions within this plan five years and my understanding is the government's commitment is to initiate action on all of these by then but not necessarily to have completed the work that needs to be done to realize them can you talk a bit about how you see say priorities being set within that or where you hope to be five years from now well i hope to be further down the path than i am today and I, I think that I speak for all of the leaders present and, and peoples across British Columbia that uh, we don't expect to finish the race the day we start it. We expect to finish it over time. Uh, the federal government, I think, did a 20 years, is that what they said? Longer period. A longer period of time. Uh, everyone wants to do things by tomorrow in an age of um, Twitter and, um, and technology, but the work needs to be done. And, and it's, not, uh, it's not easy work, it's not for wimps, to quote the Grand Chief. And we're hopeful that the priorities will be made clear based on our engagement with the Leadership Council and, and all of the others that are participating in doing what has never happened on planet Earth before. This is an exciting time, but it's a daunting time as well. And I wouldn't presume to make decisions uh, without consult consulting with my colleagues uh, at the Leadership Council and with the Minister as we go forward. Uh, but the priority is to keep working on making progress, and that's uh, how we got here today, and that's how we'll get ready for tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Moving to the phone line, we have Lisa Yuzda, City News. I think this might be for Cheryl Casimir. You said in your, um, in your comments that you were hoping that people see themselves in this, and I'm just wondering if you can talk to that a bit more because I think you know, people who are not Indigenous see this as overwhelming. Well, everybody sees this as overwhelming and perhaps more aspirational than actual. And so I'm wondering if you could just talk a bit about what you meant with that. Well, thanks very much for the question. I think it would be uh, under-inclusive to use the word aspirational because really it's a vision with outcomes that are identified in the document. We have objectives. We have here's where we want to be as outcomes. And then we have specific measures to try uh, to get there. So when you use the word aspirational, yes, we, we co-developed this. This is the vision that we want for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people uh, alike because the belief is, that I'm certainly that you would agree, that if Indigenous people's full potential is realized, we'll realize the full potential of all of our province. So I think that's, I think the, as for the actions, the actions, 89 of them, are tangible, measurable. I'd invite you to look at them. They're things you can actually say, you can get your arms around and do during the five-year period. Some of them have already been undertaken. A couple of them had already been done. We passed legislation to in the last session to deal with a couple of them. Uh, and uh, anti-Indigenous racism was one of them. Uh, but we have so much, uh, so much more to do. And I think at the, 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 the beauty of this co-developed plan this, is that we'll have the opportunity every year to be held to account for it because it requires an annual report. And we'll see where, how much progress we've made. We've made some progress in some. Some of the measures are going to be so transformational that we'll, we'll get a good start, as the Premier said, but no one will, will ever think we could finally conclude. Others will be very easy to put a check mark beside. And we'll continue to work together as other action plans occur in our future. Lisa, do you have a follow up? Yes, when people are driving home tonight or going to be listening to this story on our news show, what do you hope that they take with it that is a step that they will do as part of this next five year plan? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that people who are tuning in uh, to these issues today will take some time to reflect on the history of British Columbia, the history of Canada, how we all came to be here. I'm the son of an immigrant. Um, aside from the Indigenous peoples present today and those uh, around British Columbia, all of us came from somewhere else. And we are on territory that was unseated when we arrived. There have been treaties that have been developed, and I'm grateful that the um, Alliance of Modern Treaty uh, Nations are participating. Uh, because it's not the end when a treaty is signed, it's the beginning of a relationship. Similarly, when we tabled the legislation two and a half years ago, it was not a final day, this is it, we're done, high fives all around. It was, as Grand Chief Stuart Phillip highlighted, when the heavy lifting started. So those who are tuning in today and learning about the Declaration Act and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I'll hope they'll reflect on 
the benefits of all of us have of living in this spectacular place and the, the talents and, and the unique uh, traditions that are sprinkled around our communities, indigenous and non, and uh, acknowledge that today is the day we began the journey together. We're all paddling in the same direction. Hopefully, over time, we'll all be in the same canoe. Those are the types of things that inspire us as a government. Uh, those are the types of things that inspire, quite frankly, the, uh, the secretariat that, that Murray has put together to drive this. Uh, this is not a, a uh, Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation initiative. It is a government initiative. All ministers are responsible for delivering on the action plan. All ministries are responsible for ensuring that the work that they do recognizes and understands the commitments that we've made to each other through legislation, unanimously supported by all parties. Uh, and, and that's what I hope people will take away from this. It's a good start on a new beginning for all of us. And I'm hopeful that uh, tomorrow will be brighter than our past when it comes to how we interact with each other. Next question is from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you. Um, just to follow up a little bit on that, does the provincial government have a plan to bring non-Indigenous residents and taxpayers in British Columbia who, I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of racism in this province. What will you do to convince voters and taxpayers that they need to support this? Well, uh, uh, we're working on anti-racism strategies all the time. Uh, Rosalie talked about uh, uh, police uh, and the disproportionate number of Indigenous people who are incarcerated in British Columbia and indeed in Canada. Uh, we're uh, reviewing in an all-party committee the Police Act uh, it, with a view to uh, ferreting out those elements that are, are inherently racist and making sure that the law is uh, governed and, and, um, and protected by law enforcement that understand and, and have modern tools to work with because we now live in a society that's quite different from the one that we did 50 years ago when the Police Act was drawn up. And for citizens who are saying, what's in it for me, if that's your question, uh, Lisa, and I, I hope that, that that's what I took out of it, what's in it for British Columbians is uh, certainty. Uh, what's in it for British Columbians is an understanding of who we are as a people and where we can go together. The legislature passes laws. We did so in this case unanimously. Uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous members, uh, BIPOC members, uh, and uh, I, I'm confident that as we go forward on this roadmap, it will be a brighter day for all of us. Uh, that's the commitment we've made to each other, and that's the uh, commitment I make to all British Columbians. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Thank you. I'd like to ask the Indigenous leaders who are here today, uh, are there any sort of potential pitfalls that you are mindful of in this process and you'll be keeping an eye on? Anyone? You guys can self-select on this. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Lydia. Lydia's coming. Okay. Siam okay. Messier, I respected ones, clearly at the snap. Uh, Lydia Wheatsum, Chief of the Couch and Tribes, member of the Political Executive for the First Nations Summit. I think we're very well aware of where the pitfalls are. We've experienced them consistently. What this is, is an opportunity to go around those pitfalls and work together as partners to go forward. For too long, Indigenous people, of course, have been subjugated out of our um, rights, our lands, our territories. And this is a relationship where we can recognize collectively that Indigenous people, we were here first. I, my grandmother spoke to me, born in the 1880s, spoke to me about our presence here. And as we go forward, yes, there's going to be pitfalls, but it's our job to work together to avoid them. And part of that is about recognizing the inherent right of Indigenous people to be self-determining. And this is such an incredible opportunity to work together towards that. So without question, pitfalls, but We've seen them all already. You know, we have to go forward in a better way. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, Eric Plummer, Hashulsa newspaper. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I recall when DREPA was passed more than two years ago, there was approximately 5,000 laws that needed to be brought into compliance in BC with UNDRIP. Um, I'm wondering if someone could speak to the progress in this respect and to give us some sort of a timeline as to when all BC laws can be brought into compliance with UNDRIP. 
Well, well, thanks very much for the question. One of the things we've done, and the Premier alluded to it, and it's in the action plan, is create a, uh, an organization to serve the entire government, not the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, but rather the entire government, called the Secretariat. And it is going to be initially uh, uh, assigned the responsibility, the mammoth responsibility of aligning our laws, as we call it. Section 3 of the Declaration Act refers to that. And so the question will be how we can prioritize the existing laws. Like, which ones are we going to do first? I've heard a lot about child welfare legislation, a lot about the Heritage Conservation Act, forestry. These are what the First Nations, in working with us in consultation and cooperation, will, will decide what the priorities should be for the existing laws. And then, of course, as new laws come forward in the shape of bills, how do we ensure that we engage deeply with them in a way we have never done before as laws come forward earlier on in the process so that there's meaningful involvement as new laws come forward as well? Eric, do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, is there any sort of a timeline that we can res uh, expect um, in terms of this compliance with UNDRIP? Are we looking at 10 years? 20 years, a generation from now? Can anyone speak to that? As we said earlier, you know, some of these actions are already underway. 89, a few of them you can already put a check mark beside, and we're grateful for that. We co-developed the, uh, the section of the Human Rights Code that specifically bans anti-Indigenous racism in the last session. That was an action that had already been, had been considered and worked on together, and we've done that, and we've got other work to do that's underway. You know, some of it will not be done, uh, I, I'm sure, for a generation. But a lot of it will be done right now. And as the Premier said, we're taking very, very large steps in the next five years. And people are going to be able to say, you did it or you didn't do it. And that level of accountability is something unique in reports like this. It cannot be compared to other plans in the past. It's, it's focused on action. It's focused on deliverables. And it's all about accountability and working together with First Nation Leadership Council and in rights and title holders to get it right. And I think we're really confident we're going to do so. That's all the time we have. Thank you for joining us.